Good morning. <laughs> I have a thank you card here from uh, Travis and Laura. Uh, most of you know they left yesterday moving to Denver. Some of you that weren't here last week didn't hear the, the way the timing of this worked out. It was several months in the making, but then when it happened, it happened really fast. Um, she went through multiple interviews and they'd hurry up and get to a point and then have to wait for a month. And um, then when they finally said it's a go, they signed the papers and I mean, she had less than two weeks from the time they signed the papers till she needed to be down there. So <clears throat> JCC family, we sure will miss all of you. Thank you for your wisdom, prayers, fellowship, and love. You all have a special place in my heart. Please keep in touch and we'll visit when we can. All my best, Laura. God bless. We will miss you guys. We will miss you all very much. See you again soon, Travis. Um, we want to keep them in our prayers. Um, they're going to Denver. And quite honestly, Denver's a dark place. There's a lot of things going on in there that uh, I grew up in Denver. And it's not the same place I grew up in. So let's keep them in prayer. Let's pray they get established and knitted into a good fellowship down there and that their lives will shine brightly. Uh, Travis will be back periodically. He's still doing the guiding, at least at this point. Laura will be back uh, sometime in October um, just for a brief visit as they make plans to get the movers down. So uh, continue to keep Travis and Laura in your prayers. Um, how many of you had a good morning this morning? Thank God. <laughs> because, man, my morning stunk. I don't know what, where my brain was this morning, but I was thinking I had a whole lot more time than I did. And I got up late, and I'm, everything was off. And uh, I've talked with several people this morning that had off mornings. And, and I just, I know that the devil was trying very hard. Uh, I know there were some problems with the worship team. Um, you know, Benjamin's got that fancy black guitar and a string broke right as they were wrapping up um, practice. Evidently, they were going to do a heavier song than we did here. Um, it just was an off morning. It was one of those mornings where you feel like you're two steps behind. Um, so pray for me because the message that I have for you today, there's actually two parts to this. And I'm going to blame Jean for the first part because she gave me an ask the pastor question. And I keep telling you guys, you're making it easy. Jean took care of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> it's okay if I just read the question, right? Would you? Because I can give it just right back to you. I got it all typed up. Okay. So this is actually a very good question. Okay, so essentially what it says is scripture indicates that salvation comes through repentance, confession of sins, putting faith in Jesus and being baptized for the forgiveness of sin. So where does the praying Jesus into your hearts come from, come in, since it was invented in America in the 1800s? Are those saved that way really saved if they have not been biblically baptized too? Okay, so there's actually two parts to this question. The first one is... Um, Let's deal with asking Jesus into your heart. Okay, up front, point blank. That is not a scriptural, a biblical concept. Okay, you will not find that anywhere in scripture. Okay, the one passage that uh, they use is out of Revelation, uh, mm -hmm. chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. There is no word heart there. He's not speaking of salvation in that moment. He's actually speaking correction to a church that had gotten off. Okay? He's talking about restoring a right relationship with Christians, not with unbelievers. Okay? So the idea of asking Jesus into your heart, while, you know, it's not a scriptural principle, I'm very cautious about the phrase because that's, the, the idea is... is not really there. 
Now, we know that we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, you know, for those of you that for years have been telling people you need to ask Jesus into your heart, don't worry, God's big, he can take care of that. It's not like you're speaking heresy, okay? <laughs> but it's a concept that is unique to our time. And it's not really something that you'll find biblically. Because salvation is what? Let's, uh, th this is funny because this ties in so well with my message. And, but I'm going to kind of go in two different veins. Um, first, Gene brought up a very good point about baptism and salvation. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, I do not ascribe to the belief in regenerative baptism. I believe baptism is a covenantial sign. It is the covenantial sign of the New Testament, the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we had a covenant that was of the law, that was given to Abraham, and then the law brought through by Moses. The sign of that covenant was what? Circumcision. Okay? Now, was circumcision the covenant? No. Because if that were the case, anybody that was circumcised was automatically included in the covenant, and women, you're out. Okay? So no, it's the sign of the covenant. Now, in Israel, the, the babies were required to be circumcised on the eighth day. But they still had to choose whether or not to be participants in that covenant. Okay? Baptism, I believe, is the exact same idea. I don't believe you need baptism to be saved. But as a saved person, you need to be baptized. It is a sign of the covenant. Now, I've been baptized three times. Once I got sprinkled in the Lutheran church, once I got baptized in the church of God, and once I got baptized in the Pentecostal church. I got dunked, I got dunked, I got sprinkled. Okay? So I've been showered and bathed. All right? But, just because you are baptized does not guarantee salvation. Okay, now why do I believe? Because there are a number of scriptures. There are, uh, I came up with a, at least six or seven scriptures that associate baptism with salvation. Why do I believe that the two are not joined, but they're sequential? I believe that because scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, that we are saved by faith. Okay, sorry, excuse me. Saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Okay? There is no work that you can do that will gain you salvation. None. There is nothing you can do. Even the faith that you have, that you have to exhibit to be saved, the believing part, God enables you to believe. The only thing you've got to do is say, okay. Okay? So, salvation, simply put, is believing and receiving. Okay? Now, don't, some of you that have been part of the, the name it and claim it, and blab it and grab it group, I'm not talking that. Okay? I'm not talking that. Because one of the things that really, really upsets me about that group is they want to name and claim all the blessings, what they see as the blessings, and they forget that we also share in the sufferings. Oh, no, you just don't have enough faith. You just blasphemed. Because if Jesus didn't have enough faith, why did he go to the cross? Why did he suffer? Why was he persecuted? Side note, we'll get back on track now. You have to believe, one, the relative nature of man and God. We are separated by sin. You have to believe that. You cannot come to God with any other understanding. We are separated by sin. You have to believe that the price that Jesus paid on the cross was sufficient 
to redeem us into a right relationship with God. The resurrection proved that the cross was enough. Okay? So it's not just that he went to the cross, but he was resurrected. So we know that the cross was sufficient. Okay? So faith is what is, re is, what is required of us unto salvation. Now, there are a number of passages that associate salvation with um, baptism. I can go through and list them and I can explain to you why the way that you're reading it isn't really the way that it's read. But honestly, then we're going to start getting into a lot of hermeneutics. We're going to start getting into a lot of the aorist tense and the passive tense of, of the words that are being used. And, and quite honestly, there's men that do a much better job at this than I do. Okay? Simply put, from my perspective, if you have to be baptized to be saved, then you are doing a work unto salvation that God says can't be done. Okay? There's no other way you can read Ephesians. A lot of people try and make that excuse. Well, you know, baptism is not really a work. Yes, it is. It's a deed you do. There's no other way to read that scripture. It, it's an act that you engage in to try and attain something. Okay? Now, personally, I have a, a number of other reasons why I subscribe to this theory, this <coughs> theology. One, when was righteousness attributed to Abraham? When he believed. Now, Abraham was an inheritor. He was the receiver, the initial receiver of the covenant with God, right? Okay? But when did he get baptized? I mean, oh, wrong covenant. Oh, oh, okay, so when did he get circumcised? He, he didn't get circumcised until much later. When did he follow the law? Well, actually, he never followed the law because that didn't come until 400 years later. See, the same thing saves us today that saved them then. It's faith in their perspective to the Messiah to come, the promise yet to be had, and on this side of the cross, we are receiving, we are having faith in the Messiah that has come. Okay? Now, one thing I wanted to share. We talk a lot about believing. Okay? You understand that saving faith is not just acknowledging what has happened. Okay? Um, Chris, would you bring my water up, please? <clears throat> saving faith has to go beyond just agreeing with what has happened. Because anybody can look, if you look critically at the historicity of the life of Jesus Christ, you can agree, oh yeah, he was a good man. Oh yeah, he died. Oh yeah, he was resurrected. There's no body to be found. You can agree with all of those points and not be saved. Because saving faith believes in the truth of what happened and what he has said is to come. Okay? Saving faith says, I diminish and he increases. I die that he lives in me. I become the servant, he becomes the Lord. See, we, we like the idea of Jesus being Savior. We don't like the idea so much of him being Lord. Because him being Lord means that we are subject to his will, what he wants. I want the goodies, but I don't want the responsibilities. Okay? <clears throat> so, I have a lot more written in the paper. I actually put in some links for you to go, because they write much better than I do. So I've got a, a two-page up here for you to take a look at, take a gander. So this actually, I really appreciate God's timing, because this week, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We are still working through spiritual warfare. We are currently in the armor of God. Okay? Um, last week we talked about the shield of faith. 
Would you put the shield picture up, please? That's the shield I was talking about. Now, no, that's not a midget. Okay? The shield is about four feet tall, rectangular, rounded on the edges. It covered a significant portion of the soldier when they would stand in the line together in their, their, their shield wall. They would crouch down behind it. Remember with those feet shod with the spikes? Planting those feet, holding that shield, getting down behind it. How much of a target do you have on that right there? Not much, do you? That target is going to absorb every flaming arrow that comes at him, isn't it? Well, what about his back? What about his sides? That's where they fought in a block. Okay? They fought together. So there were men on either side of him. There were men behind him. As a matter of fact, they, they had the, uh, oh, and I just lost the word, the turtle. And they would take a, a square of men. And sometimes you're talking 100 men across and 100 men deep. And people would be shooting things over the top. And the men in the front, they'd put their shields up. The ones in behind, they put the shields over their heads. The ones on the side would turn their shields out. And the ones in the back would have their shields facing the other direction. There was no way to penetrate that. They called it the turtle, the tortoise. Okay? So that's our shield of faith that we have. And it works best. The idea behind this shield is when you work together. My shield covers the person to my left. The person on my right, his shield covers my right. That way I can still use the sword, which we will get to in a couple weeks. Okay? But this week, we're actually talking about the helmet of salvation. Now you see the helmet peeking out over the top there. Would you put up the other picture? Um, so let's get to Ephesians chapter 6 real quick. I'm going to read the passage, and then we'll, we'll kind of pick up there. So starting in verse 10, Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> um, I, I have something. I'm going to back up here just a minute. Um, you know, we started off the armor of God. We talked about the belt of truth. And we talked about, you know, that's not a fashion accessory. Okay, it's not something to hold your britches up. Okay. Um, it, it is a defensive piece of armor used to protect you. Okay. And it's truth. It's, it is a guard, I, I told you. Uh, I know a lot of people believe that to be, um, you know, have your loins girded about with truth, the, the gospel, the word, the Bible. I don't believe that that's what Paul is speaking about specifically. I believe it is more uh, a, a, a protection against hypocrisy. Okay? Understanding who you are. <coughs> Not just acting like a Christian, but being a Christian. I'm saying this because I read an article um, two days ago that, that just absolutely floored me. Uh, there's a pastor at a church, uh, you don't need to know the name or the church, that uh, was being interviewed, and he was actually in an, uh, 
a discussion with another gentleman, and, and this pastor said that if Jesus were alive today, he would revise his opinion on homosexual marriage. That Jesus was wrong then, and he would change his mind now. And that the guy that he was discussing with, I have no idea whether the gentleman he was discussing with was a Christian or not. In some manner, he knew scripture because he actually quoted several scriptures and asked this man, so you're saying that Jesus was wrong and he would change his mind today? Absolutely yes. Now this is a pastor of a church that is supposed to be a body made up of believers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a false teacher who is telling people what their itching ears want to hear. Okay? Look, I don't understand why God put everything in this word that he did. There's a lot of times I read something and I, I go, okay, God, I don't understand this at all. Why is this in here? If my life would be a whole lot easier if this were not here. But it's not given to me, nor to you, nor to anyone else to pick and choose which scriptures we adhere to. We are given all of them. Okay? And so when somebody comes, I don't care what their status, I don't care what their popularity, I don't care about their degrees. But when somebody comes and tells you something that is against the plain truth of scripture... run. Have nothing to do with them. They are a false teacher and the judgment against those will be especially harsh. James tells us, not many of you should presume to teach my brothers, for we know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Pray for that man. Pray for that man. Pray that God will open his eyes to truth. Okay? This is why we have to be protected by truth. All right? So, we'll move back from that segue back to where I was going a little bit ago. We were talking about the helmet of salvation. Now, you see that helmet? It looks kind of weird, doesn't it? But every piece on that helmet has a purpose. Okay? It's actually an incredibly ingenious device for waging war. Now keeping in mind, he's got this big shield in front of him and his head is what's going to be the most vulnerable because he's got to be able to see over the shield to be able to deal with the enemy, right? So you'll notice that it's got a couple of bridges, one going across the brow, one going across the top. Both of those are significant. The one going across the top adds strength side to side to the helmet. The one going across the brow, while it also adds strength, it protects the face from downward strikes, deflecting them away from the face. Okay? You'll notice the flange projecting off the back of the neck. That also protected the, that thing right there. Somebody comes down over the top of you, they can't get you from the front because your shield's in the way. The only way they can do is coming down over the top. That protects the back of the neck. It's going to push the blows away from the neck. All right? These two little dog ear things hanging down there, they actually would tie together underneath the chin, and they would protect the sides of the face. You think, well, okay, but what about the front of the face? This is actually a very good design because... You know, um, we see all these, these pictures of the medieval knights and these huge suits of armor and, and these masks that had these little slits. Did you know that most of the men that fought in those suits of armor were not killed by the sword or the mace or the... They were killed by exhaustion. They couldn't get enough oxygen in through that little slit to fight a long battle. And they would literally expire because they, they run themselves to death. Okay? This allowed not only for oxygen to get to your face, but it also allowed 
that you could, and, and this right here, this actually would probably, you notice the little notch right between the flap and the flange? That's for the ear. It's open. This is an infantry helmet. We know that because the cavalry actually had protection over their ear. I don't know why. They're afraid of the horse or something. But, but this is a, an infantry helmet, and it allowed for communication back and forth, which was necessary because when you fought in formation, everybody had to move the same way at the same time. There had to be communication. Okay? And when the, the centurion, the sergeant, would shout out a directive, they had to be able to hear what was going on. They had to be able to pass the word down. So this helmet is actually a brilliant piece of engineering. Okay? Now, then you'll see a bunch of others. There's, there's the ones with the, the uh, horse tail that goes across the top. Nobody has any idea why those were used. I, I heard people speculate, well, it, it merited a signified rank, possibly. Well, if it went from the front to the back, then it was probably just an enlisted man, and if it went from the side to side, it was an officer, except for in these cases. Well, if they were of a certain color, that denoted rank, except for when you have an entire cohort with that color. So every time somebody puts something forth, somebody else goes, well, what about this? So what they were for, we know they were decorative. They look nice. Other than that, we don't know anything. Okay? So basic infantry helmet, protective. Now, Paul is looking at a, a soldier. When he's describing all these things. Okay? You know the, the word that he uses here actually uh, from the Greek? It actually means head wrap. It's something you put around your head. And because he's describing the armor, we put it as a helmet. You know that word is only used twice in the New Testament for helmet? This, this idea of covering your head? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, don't turn there, I'll just read it to you. Um, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, he says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, both times he correlates salvation to the helmet. I think he does that specifically. I, I don't think he's just kind of randomizing things here. Okay? What, what is salvation? What, what is salvation? Being saved. Well, okay, yeah. What is being saved? What does that mean? <laughs> what are you saved from? You, you know what you're actually saved from? You're, you're saved from the wrath of God. Scripture makes it very clear that the salvation that has come is that we would not suffer God's just wrath. Now that is because of sin. We are delivered from sin as a part of that because the only way that God can restrain his wrath is if we are somehow found innocent of sin. Hell, the lake of fire, the place of eternal torment, is a result of sin. So yeah, we're, we're saved from both of those things, but only because we are saved from the wrath of God. Now you've got to wrap your mind around this for a minute. Because it's not fire insurance. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. I better get saved. Thank you, God, for saving me from hell. That's... That's such a minute part of this. We're not only saved from, but we're saved to. Now... This is where we run into a lot of trouble, okay? Because we so poorly understand the idea of salvation, 
we, we kind of have like a kindergarten mentality regarding salvation. We don't really study it. We don't really look to know what it means. Okay? Not that, you know, being saved from hell is anything to look down on. Not that being saved from our sins is anything to frown on. But what is the advantage of not going to hell and not living in sin? What is the advantage? There's got to be something to replace those. Right relationship. See, the, see that the whole Christian life is based on relationship. Every morning, just, just about every morning, I, I send out scriptures to my kids. The, the adoptees and uh, the blood <laughs> and those that, that are just, I, I send scriptures out to them. And this morning I actually had planned on sending the scripture that I read, um, Psalm 100. <coughs> And I, I caught a glimpse of another scripture that talks about God delighting in his people. God delighting, God taking pleasure in his people. Have you ever considered the idea that God enjoys you? <coughs> that God likes you? That he takes delight in his relationship with you? Do you, do you consider that this is what he is looking for? God desires that all men would be saved, but saved from what? From his wrath. God does not desire to pour out wrath on men. If he did, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. He wouldn't have saved Noah. God's desire is for right relationship. He wants to be friends. What did Jesus tell the disciples? I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Friends. Can you confidently say that you are God's friend? Can you with boldness proclaim to people that God is your friend? I, I love... Vivian, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rat on you. We, uh, Christian and I were over at Vivian's a while back, and, and I, I love the relationship that Vivian has with God. Because every morning she comes out and she sits and she talks with him as she would an old friend. He's her husband. He's her caretaker. He's her friend. I love. See, I, I still, I get caught up in the works. I gotta do, I gotta do, I gotta do, I gotta do. I shared with you last week, <clears throat> God had uh, used someone to speak to me that he wants to spend time with me. I, I, I have a, I don't, my brain has a hard time wrapping around that. And God gave me a very significant lesson in that. I have uh, one son that, that I was, uh, all, I'm close to all of my kids. I, I love them all. But I have one son that I'm not as close to today as I used to be. And they happened to come down a few weeks ago. All the family was together. There were 17 of us. And I'm waiting for more. Um, I was sitting outside, we were having dinner, and I was sitting outside, and I was watching my son. Now, all of my kids are good workers. They didn't have a choice in my family because we worked. You just worked. Stuff needed to be done? All right, we'll come and do it. They're all good workers. But I was watching this son, and, and he, he's very quick. You know, when we're done eating, he starts clearing up, and, and he and his wife, and, and they're doing dishes, and they're awesome servants. But I, I found myself getting frustrated and thinking, just put the stupid dishes down and come sit and talk with me. I just want to talk with you. And God poked me in the heart and said, aha. And see, I, I, I got it. He wants to spend 
time with me. I get so caught up in the doing and the works and, and trying to accomplish and trying somehow to earn his favor. And I know theologically, I know intellectually, I can do nothing to earn his favor. I've already got it. He wants to spend time with me. He wants to sit and talk. And that takes time. It takes focus. You've got to, you know, I, I love potlucks because I get an opportunity to talk to more people Sundays. Quite honestly, after church Sunday, I end up frustrated a lot of times. Because for every person I get to talk to, two or three of you walk out the door and I don't get to talk to. And potlucks extend that time so I get a chance to talk to more of you. But it takes time. I have to make time. It's the same with God. And it's so distracting. You know when you're talking with someone and you're carrying on a conversation and they keep going, yeah. Uh-huh. That's a really good point. Oh, I hadn't heard that before. Ooh. Say that again. Yeah. No, no. It's okay. It's a new game. Angry Candyland. <laughs> Do you find that distracting? Do you feel like they're paying attention? Do you feel like you're building a relationship? Isn't that what we do to God? Hey, brother. We haven't talked in a long time. Let's talk. I got two and a half minutes and then I got to go. Good talk. See you later. Do you, do you feel like relationship was built there? No. It takes time. It takes devotion. The helmet of salvation. Now, why do you suppose Paul talked about the helmet of salvation? Why did he put that on our head? I, I, I want to share with you why I think this is important. And it kind of ties in with the shield of faith. Okay? We talked last week about the flaming arrows of the enemy. Remember? And we talked about how insidious those are because, I mean, you get hit with an arrow, it's bad enough. Right? But these guys weren't content to just shoot you with an arrow. They would take the arrowhead and wrap it in cloth, soak it in pitch, and then light it on fire. Okay. And then shoot you with it. Okay, now the first reaction, you got fire coming out of your body, which is not good. Okay, so you would grab the arrow and you'd yank it out. Okay, thereby compounding the wound. Arrows are meant to go through, not come back out. And then the pitch would get inside the wound and it would infect the wound. And oftentimes, a wound that would be really not significant as far as uh, the wound itself would, would turn deadly because the infection would actually kill the soldier. See, the, the devil plays the long game. Boy, if he can knock you out with just an arrow, great. But if he can get that arrow in and sow some pitch in there and cause an infection and cause you to start dying in the long term, even better. Now, the helmet of salvation, I think it's significant that we put that over our heads because one of the areas that the enemy is going to attack us in is our relationship with God. That's salvation. Oh, God's not forgiving you. You really think God wants you? Oh, I saw what you did. I saw what you did. Oh, yeah, God saw it too. Now, if our minds are wrapped up in the idea, the true idea, the true understanding of salvation, those whispers are going to bounce off. Uh-huh, no. I'm saved. I have been redeemed. I have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. I stand before God in His righteousness, not my own. You're right, I messed up, but I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. And you know what, devil? I'm probably going to mess up tomorrow too. And I'm forgiven there also. 
And you know what, devil? You didn't even bring this one up. I'm forgiven of that as well. See, my God's grace is bigger than my sin. My God's salvation has delivered me from those things that you are trying to impute to me. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but the blood that covers me is. And when I stand before God and you come and you list all those things, His Son will stand beside me and say, No, this one is mine, bought and paid for. See, this is where our minds need to dwell. This is the helmet that protects us, protects our thinking. And as the enemy whispers those lies, especially with areas where we stumble frequently, we all have them. We all have areas that we stumble frequently in. Okay? Now, let me make this clear. Understand this point in light of what I just said. If you have habitual sin, you've got to stop. Okay? You've got to stop. Not because you won't be saved, but because you are a representative of Jesus Christ, and that sin is an affront to the one who gave his life to you. You want to be pleasing to God? Choose him over the sin. Okay? Don't allow sin to dwell in you because of God's grace. Remember what Paul says? What then? Should we sin all the more that his grace may abound all the more? No! Okay? That's, that's kind of verbally what he's writing there. There is no stronger term that can be used than what he uses. Absolutely not! I hear a parenthetical follow-up to that. You moron! I, your Bibles are probably different than your head. That's how my Bible in my head reads. No, you don't. You, what? Come, really? He has paid this great price, and you're going to take that as an allowance for more sin? Dumb. Okay? So, this helmet that we put on our heads, how often do we wear it? Always. Always. See, here's the thing, guys. When you take up the armor, you don't take it off. You got to keep it up at all times because the enemy doesn't go to bed at night. The enemy doesn't take a time out for a latte. The enemy is unremitting, unceasing. He is always moving against you. This is another reason that I am absolutely convinced that. Christians have got to be knitted in to a fellowship. Not just popping in once in a while. They've got to be knitted in so that they have those shields to the left and to the right, those armored brothers and sisters helping to guard them. Okay? This is why I believe it is so important to be knitted into a body. I believe it's also important that we be transparent. That's, oh, that's scary, isn't it? Man, they might not like me if they knew those things. Well, if they have the heart of God, they'll love you. And if they don't, that'll be revealed. I, I, I got to tell you, after talking with some other people over the course of uh, the last two weeks about church, I love our church. Man, I look forward <laughs> to be with you guys, especially after some of the stories I hear from other pastors. Oh. I, I was, uh, Ken and I got to meet uh, with a friend of Ken's. He was introducing me to this gentleman and he was telling me about this town that they lived in. They went to the church and, and uh, they, they couldn't stay there. There was just so much backbiting and infighting in the church. So they, they went to another church and he said every church they attended in that town had this can you imagine trying to worship in that atmosphere? Can you imagine trying to be transparent in that atmosphere? I ain't going to say that, man. They're going to bash me over the head with it. I thank God every day for you guys because you make my job so easy. 
Now, we, we have disagreements. I mean, some of you guys don't like the, the, the avalanche. Some of you guys don't even like hot. <laughs> I'm still trying to understand that. <laughs> I mean, how many churches are you going to see a Denver Bronco fan sitting with a Seahawk fan? Well, I noticed they're on opposite sides this week. <laughs> Football season must be getting ready to start. <laughs> well, seriously, in this body, one of the things that I really, I really want to push is that we have to agree on the essentials. But, but the non-essentials? We have grace. Okay? We have grace. Because there are so many things in Scripture that do not have a bearing on whether or not you're saved. Okay? They, they don't. And that's part of the reason that I'm, I'm asking other pastors to come in and share with us. Because some of the pastors that I'm coming in are going to have radically different non-essential ideas. Okay? And I want us to understand that we have more in common than we don't. Because we have a Lord and Savior who is infinite. Yeah, there's, there's things that some of the pastors and some of the churches, they do in their churches that I go, wow, I wouldn't do that. I mean, some of those guys wear suits. <laughs> 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 I'm not even sure how to respond. <laughs> does, that, does that mean my, my shirt and jeans aren't good enough, Mary Lou? Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Mary Lou. You gotta be careful with Mary Lou because if she's not happy with you, she'll thump you. <laughs> Sometimes when she's happy with you, she thumps you. <laughs> but I, I thank God for you guys. I pray often that God would confound the plans of the enemy regarding this body. That in this body we would be quick to see the wolves in sheep's clothing because they will come. They will come. That we would be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. That we would be able to discern what's going on. Because this battle that we're waging, it's not in the physical realm. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And we need every ounce of God's might that he'll give us so that we can stand. I pray that we would speak the truth in love. That when somebody is having an issue, that we would have the courage to speak the truth, but always doing so in love. Not love for self. Loving them. I, I often... I, I have... Two types of dreams predominantly. I have nightmares that are sometimes horrific. And, and I have dreams that I go, what in the world was that? Okay? But very rarely do I have good dreams. Now, I've had a situation in my life over the last couple years that has led to a number of, of really uncomfortable dreams. Okay? And I've been praying because... I know you guys are different than I am and you guys have a lot more together than I do. But a lot of times when I wake up in the morning after having had one of those dreams, I can be affected in how I act during the day. Especially toward the people that are in the dream. And I've been asking God to, God give me good dreams. And I had a dream the other night that, about this, this situation. That I, like I said, it's been a couple of years that I've had bad dreams and some of them like really bad dreams. And I had one of the most awesome, incredible dreams that, that I've ever had. And I was sharing it with Christy and she said, do you think that was heaven? No, I don't think it was heaven. I think it's the way it's supposed to be. I, I think it's the way it's supposed to be. And I thank God for that because where I found my heart getting kind of hard before and I was really struggling to be Christ-like, <clears throat> I, I now found myself motivated by love. And when I started praying for that situation and the people in that situation, 
I could honestly pray God's best for them and not, not God's best for me. So we take up the full armor. We take up the shield of faith. We gird ourselves with the belt of truth. We put the heart guard on, the breastplate of righteousness. Put the helmet of salvation on. We get our feet ready. Preparation, gospel so that we can stand and not be moved. Every one of those that we've talked about is a defensive weapon. See, next week we're going to talk about the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. Tearing down of strongholds. See, we're not a people with a fortress mentality. We're not cowering behind the walls going, Somebody save me! We are men and women, mighty warriors that wage battle on a plane that most people will never see. We have the strength of God driving us, filling us, empowering us to accomplish His will and His purposes. We are not a weak people. We are a meek people. Oh, isn't that the same thing? No. Weak means you just can't do something. Meek means you can and you choose not to. Father, I bless you today. Father, that you have equipped us for this battle. You have not sent us naked into the war, into the conflict, but you have clothed us, equipped us, armed us, that we would do battle. <coughs> Father, I ask that you would seal in our minds this salvation so rich. <coughs> Father, that we would be mindful to always take up our armor, never lay it down. That, Father, we would be quick to stand in line with our brothers and sisters, to shield them, to guard them, to protect them, even as they do for me. I ask God for your wisdom that we would properly use all that you've given us to your glory. We bless you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name.